So we're here with the uh, Roger Penrose Institute meeting, and I'm talking with David Sontag. And David, you have some interesting ideas about retro information and and remote viewing and non-local storage. You want to talk a little bit about what? Tell me about your background and how you got there and what's up there. Well, I I, I don't have a lot of. I, I collect interesting ideas. I spent 23 years on active duty with the Air Force as a biomedical scientist, and I ran into a lot of interesting people. Uh, one of the fellows who's a keynote speaker at the conference is Anurban Bandyapadhyay. Uh, I funded a grant to him starting in 2009 to ask the question of uh, biological information processing and microtubules. Yeah. Prior, prior to that, I had done some work uh, just looking at broad aspects of science and technology futures. Uh, obviously, things like Hameroff and Penrose's yeah. quantum consciousness arise from that. I attended the uh, Google organized a workshop on quantum biology in 2009. So I've been running into a lot of interesting people. Can we back up? What's a microtubule? So inside of the cell, microtubules form a key part of the skeleton. Uh, if you go back to your biology 101, everybody remembers where the chromosomes line up and they pull apart. Those little strings that pull those chromosomes apart during uh, mitosis are part of that uh, cytoskeleton. So they, yeah. they form a key part of the cell in holding it together and moving things around. Um, and uh, Hameroff and Penrose came up with the concept of that's where we really think the information processing is happening inside of the cell. Um, so getting back to your, what you're talking about with uh, non, non-temporal, non-local information storage, um, I'm not a quantum physicist by any means, but I've done work in DNA damage uh, and a lot of the electronics, the, the biochemistry of what happens. If you, if you allow for quantum effects at biological scale, and these were all questions that caused people like Google to organize this workshop and say, does nature in certain circumstances do quantum? The answer now is yes, very clearly. So photosynthesis, for example, is the best example of that. Uh, what do you mean, do quantum? What does that mean? Meaning, uh, can quantum coherent states exist in a biological time scale? meaning a delocalization of the electrons in, in a biological system. So um, it's pretty clear now from photosynthesis, when you get sunlight coming in, you hit the chlorophyll pigment, that converts the photon energy into chemical energy. That's an incredibly energy efficient process. And the way it happens is that nature has figured out this quantum optimization process, if you will, where something is in a superposition of states and it, it it finds the optimal solution, in essence. What efficiency does that run, do you know? It's something like 90% or better. I Don't yeah. quote me on the number. Um, our best solar panels right now, a really good solar panel, will convert 20% or more of the sunlight that hits it into, into electrical the energy. Commercial grade. NASA yeah. does better. But, yeah, uh, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so how does this relate to the idea that information could be being passed backwards or a system could be anticipatory um, that the, the time doesn't necessarily have to be monotonically increasing for all yeah. systems. If people like to quote Einstein who, who talked about spooky action at a distance and you get a lot of um, people who, you know, from the new age crowd, if they want to invoke something that we don't understand, they wave their hands and say it's quantum but um, one of the views I think that's, that's interesting, if you talk to people in, in, in the consciousness realm, where does the information reside? Um, Michael Persinger has been around for a long time. Um, he's invented a, a directed energy helmet that can stimulate the brain in such a way that people have this really profound exper experience. People call it the God helmet. And, uh, Persinger believes that information can be non-local uh, from our consciousness and that it's actually uh, distributed, if you will, throughout the geomagnetic environment of the Earth. Uh -huh. So Now you were saying there's some research that the CIA was doing uh, many years ago that's now being declassified? Yeah, so starting in the late 60s and the early 70s, um, 
the CIA and a lot of the other different uh, agencies of the, the intelligence community were primarily concerned about what was going on in the Soviet Union uh, in what they called psychoenergetics. They led a number of contracts to uh, people like Putoff and Targ at the Stanford Research Institute. Um, now if you go to the CIA website uh, to their reading room and just type in terms like Stargate or Flame Grill or Psychoenergetics or Psychotronics, it's really amazing what you'll pull up. Uh, and I would say in the last 10 years or so, they've, they've uh, through Freedom of Information Act requests, uh, they've, they've had to declassify a lot of these really interesting documents, especially in light of the sort of things that people talk about at this consciousness conference. A lot of these topics that you're hearing at the consciousness conference here, have uh, they're not really that new. They've been floating around in various uh, parts of the scientific and the, the government world for at least the last 30 or 40 years. So, I mean, my impression is a lot of this is considered fringe science and uh, uh, lunatics are uh, crazy people, basically. Uh, I, I shouldn't be quite saying it that strongly, but yeah. Uh, but but that's. Are you saying that there are new empirical activities that are bringing that into more objective and empirical science? I think that's one of the interesting things about this particular conference is that Stewart's been doing this, Hameroff has been doing this for the last 25 years, and he casts a really wide tent to bring in all aspects of the scientific, philosophical. Pretty much anybody who has an idea is welcome here. And yeah, a lot of uh, there have been some pretty, pretty uh, strong debate between different different people over the years. Uh, you know, when somebody stands up and starts talking about measuring quantum coherence in microtubules, um, certain people have been you know known to get up and walk out of the room because they think it's just crazy. Yeah. So um, I, I think things are happening so fast now in terms of uh, the dissemination of, of scientific information, but also a lot of the technology to do some of these experiments is becoming readily accessible to anybody with a microprocessor, uh, you know, an Arduino, yeah. Raspberry Pi. A lot of really interesting information can be. Uh, gathered at the citizen scientist level. And what would that be? What could a what what could a smart kid with an Arduino do in this realm? Well, um, I just talked with Anurban Bandyapadhyay, who uh, I funded as an AFOSR program manager at the National Institute of Material Sciences in Japan. Uh, we just met at the, the hotel prior to this reception. He's brought with him some of the devices based on his study of microtubules, and it's a really simple conceptual device, stringing capacitors together and wrapping them around a hollow tube. In essence, that's what the microtubule looks like. The individual proteins look like tennis balls, and they form a helical spiral around a hollow core. He's built a large analog version of this, and with a simple infrared camera, we've got some really interesting footage that he's going to be demonstrating this week. So. Yeah. Uh, it looks like it mimics some of the behaviors he's measured uh, in microtubules, which are just a few nanometers across. You were saying there's also some stuff about infrared and Alzheimer's? Yeah, I'm here with a company called Luminu. Uh, the Air Force has funded work from uh, Michael Hamlin's lab in Harvard uh, for a number of years looking at the effect of light of different wavelengths on neurological systems. And uh, we're going to hear from Marvin Berman this week, uh, describing some of the clinical trials. Infrared light in the, around uh, the near-infrared range, so 750 to 810 nanometers, penetrates really well through the skin and the bone. And uh, they've been conducting uh, trials on patients, exposing their brains to near-infrared. And uh, what, what Marvin has published, along with uh, Michael Hamlin and others, within the last two months, shows that the effect of infrared treatment is seven times better than Aricept or Doneprazil, which are the two FDA-approved drugs for Alzheimer's, with none of the side effects. It's non-invasive, and uh, some of the other uh, things that the Luminu is, is presenting have to do with 
the combination of that with other modalities of uh, neurofeedback to even get better uh, outcomes than that. And how does that work? What what happens at that wavelength that affects Alzheimer's? So the, the, the mechanism of action we believe that's happening is the mitochondria, which are the powerhouses of the cell. We can see that in, in the aging brain with Alzheimer's, the neurons just kind of start to die off and uh, the mitochondria essentially run out of gas. The, the infrared light re-energizes them. They start producing more ATP, which is kind of the currency of energy inside the cell. And um, the big thing, though, is talking to the family members and actually looking at the outcomes, the patient outcomes. Patients who haven't been able to speak for weeks all of a sudden are, are becoming engaged. They're not combative. They're not so confused. And so um, the NIH, the National Institute of Health, and, and other agencies have known about the photobiomodulation work for years. The Air Force has been funding Hamlin probably for the past 20. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's kind of frustrating and interesting that big business and even the NIH they're not really that interested in this because it's not a drug. Uh, we think it's time, though, to disrupt medicine with uh, some of the non-invasive technology. And uh, there's a lot of open minds here at this, this conference. And uh, so I enjoy coming here. Great. Uh, do you want anything else you want to say before we uh, shut down here? No. Great. Well, I enjoyed your comments. We'll get you out on... Uh, YouTube here. All right. So this is uh, La Jolla on June 5th, 19, 2017. Yeah. So. <laughs>